Welcome back to True Story with John Gibson. Today's guest is a phenomenal human being. He is an IFBB pro. He's an IFBB uh, Hall of Famer, Vince Taylor. <laughs> Happy to be here, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I was just talking to Vince offline and uh, I had the, and it's an honor, I had the honor of meeting this gentleman, I dare say 20 years ago or more, but he was <laughs> the very first professional bodybuilder I'd ever met in my life. And, you know, in your mind, there's comic books, there's TV, there's cartoons, but it's different to see it in real life. And uh, this, this guy was, he was a living legend. He'd been on the Olympia stage many times at this point, and he spent the better part of 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes talking to some 15 year old kid in a vitamin store. And I never forgot it, Vince. So cool. <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you. I can't tell you how, uh, how that it was so inspiring. Hey, I'm you're glad so you had the time to listen. <laughs> I mean, you're such, you're great. You're such a great, uh, I mean, not only just a representative of the sport, you know, but I'm so glad that, uh, you know, you existed and you've accomplished so much. So I'm just so excited again to have you today and, and get to pick your brain a little bit. Absolutely, man. This is fun. This is what I enjoy. And uh, what better host to do it with than the Big J? There you go, man. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, with that, you know, so let's let's kind of start there. Before we go too far down uh, memory lane, uh, how's life today, Vince? You know, what's a day in the life? What are you up to Oof. right now? What's going on? Man, life is rough nowadays. <laughs> um, you know, 65 years old and next month and uh, just... Every day is just a maintaining and just doing things, trying to jumpstart, reach, jumpstart Vince Taylor, or just continue living, you know, yeah. with my family and, and this Corona thing killing people again. You know, it's just yeah. a lot of stress, a lot of craziness going on. Yeah. Me just trying to uh, get busy, get ready to go out here and start working as a personal trainer. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have such a wealth of knowledge. What an amazing opportunity to train with someone like you. That would be fantastic. Got to pass that certification first. Um, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, let me ask, man. So one thing, and there's a compliment here. Uh, you know, you obviously have a lot of energy, but you don't age. Like, what are you doing? Like, what is the secret? <laughs> Must be that Coca-Cola red meat ketchup. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> my favorite. <laughs> Coca-Cola red meat with ice. All American apple pie. Yeah. It's amazing. You're you're in just as good shape now as ever. It looks like, and uh, you're so vibrant, high energy. A little lighter, you know, a little lighter physique-wise. Of course, you know, um, mm -hmm. normally at my, well, from the fifty as I ended my career at fifty, uh, my body weight, you know, was two thirty, trying to compete yeah. two forty-five to two forty four forty-five off season yeah. at at that comeback stage. But now for the last ten years. You know, it's been like 195, 200, I'm hanging around there. Yeah. And uh, just training differently, trying to do less stressful things and utilizing some of that knowledge that you have about, you know, just everyday preparation mm -hmm. to see how it really fits in. And I'm finding out that the stuff that you learn and you work with, you know, I can control how my body's starting to look, you know? Yeah, so sure. It takes, it takes good attention. You go to class one-on-one -on -one with Vince Taylor. Oh, it would be an amazing opportunity for anyone. Sit underneath that learning tree a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. So, yeah, let me ask this. So, you know, I don't need to tell you, but for those who may be unaware, you were one of the most active IFBB pros ever. You had such a busy career for a while. You were the most winning IFBB pro, I think, until maybe Dexter came in. and, and, and Yeah, so Ronnie was that. first. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie? Okay. Uh, yeah, Ronnie came in as I had retired and finished. Mm -hmm. Ronnie was on his roll, put it that way. Yeah. You know, so he came in and got 20, I think 25, maybe 26. And then Dexter was still coming along as Ronnie and those guys were running side by side, like right. two racehorses winning those shows. So right. yeah, I got out the blocks quick. That's yeah. People don't know, John. They don't know that. Well, you know, it's interesting though, because you I think they don't know though, because you you were you were so active, you were so busy, but then toward I feel like the tail end of your career, you were coming in for some of the Masters Olympias right. and stuff. So you it still felt like you were really active, I think. Uh, true that. The scene. Yeah. Yeah, true that because when I turned 40, you know, that's when I decided to shift gears in bodybuilding, only for longevity purposes, you know. Mm -hmm. Um I took a look at my my bio the other day, and I noticed my win loss record all through the, mm -hmm. you know, on that scale. Then I saw right around in 1990, you see, 96, you notice 
I went to these shows and I got seventh mm. and eighth and ninth. I remember those shows. I'm thinking, yeah. well, that was my transition period. See, when I turned 40, it was like, why am I going to continue to beat my physique up trying to catch those young lines? You know, mm. like the Lever Rones was just coming on, the Flex yeah. Wheeler, of course. You know, um, I thought I had to protect what I had been able to create, but put it in an age appropriate competition level. So I downsized my training. I did everything to accompany a different era of training now for me. And of course, the goal, which was training with people over 40. Yeah. So that was a good breakdown. But then I suffered my overall um, training. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't go super, super hard like anymore. I downsized, you know, yeah. and I was able to maintain my physique. But I noticed a difference in that type of preparation for the open class athletes. Yeah. And I saw that in my lineups because when I went on one of the tours, um, I think that's the biggest uh, black eye I saw on my records. It's like, wow, look at this tour, 96. You went from fifth place, sixth place, seventh place, and thinking, oh, yeah, that's right. Remember, Vince. You decided you weren't going on the Grand Prix tours anymore. You were going to just compete in the Masters. But now you decided the last end of it, you're going to get into the Grand Prix tours because that's how you make money. Right. And then I forgot about them. That's how you, yeah. that's the guys are going to be there. And I was thinking about yeah. maybe you can make some money still. Yeah. Dude, I, I brought my training down to associate a 40 year old physique and, and started training that way. And that was that downside took me out of that rare competitive form to be in the open class. So then I saw where my physique had faded off because I wasn't training like I was supposed to. I was training for 40 and above, not for 40 and under. Yeah. Man. So I when I saw that record. I, I just learned so much right there. Like that makes such sense because for a lot of reasons, but let me ask you this. Um, this says something about you, I think, in your character in a way. Like it takes uh, confidence in yourself to be able to like make a decision like that, to pull off and not chase those mass monsters. What gave you that self-confidence? Did you know that you were different because you had your posing and your overall presentation was just so crisp and solid? Did you feel like that gave you an advantage? Or I guess, I mean, so few bodybuilders, man, have the wherewithal to pull back. It's always push right. harder, go harder, go bigger. And uh, to hear you explain that, I'm, I'm like even more impressed that you were able to be confident with yourself and make that. Yeah, it was about being able to analyze, and I'm a very analytical person. You know, I had to analyze my physique. I had to analyze the physique that I was going to be putting my uh, competition against. Yeah. And I saw from that ratio, it's like, ooh, I'm Vince, 40 something years old, but I'm still top six in the world yes. with, with an open class. So if you're over 40, I know who you are. Yeah. I know and I expect a certain type of physique being in the masters, because if you are over 40, you were not in the masters, You've been out there in the open class, and I don't know who you are. Yeah. But since I'm looking at that lineup, so I'm thinking to myself, okay, at 40, I'm still top six in the world. Mm-hmm. Now, these guys, if I'm going to get into the over 40, they haven't seen that top six entry level. So I know I'm going to be able to just cruise in this division because it's age appropriate. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's why I was able to say, you have what it takes to continue doing what you're doing. Yeah. Just remember, you still got a top quality physique at 40. You we're did. open guys. Oh man, you it's confident going into that. You were right there. And you know, you're somebody that um, you know, I I, I think you know, those who were of your generation mm-hmm. talk about you. You know, they all talk about <laughs> you. Peers talk about you. You haven't been forgotten. But wow. you're, you're so important, I think, for the guys that came after. I don't want them to forget about you, you know, because you you were on the tail end, the sport changed. You know, in the 90s to 2000s, it changed in a lot of ways. You know, we definitely, I think Dorian brought in the mass and then Ronnie and and so forth. But we also subsequently lost a lot of posing. You know, we lost a lot of that. And the European tours, like you said, your Grand Prix, man, those were exciting. Telling me, are you telling me? I mean, when you, you know, not to cut you short, but that was like one of the catches, man, when you want to be a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay. Uh, you want to go out here, you want to do what you're going to do. But when it came down to actually being acceptable or bringing presentable, put it that way, on stage, and then you were able to do the things I was able to do and found out the reward came from the fans. Yeah. You know, that's where the reward came from. It's yeah. like, man, you just got to get out there and get in front of those fans because this is the drive that keeps you with the bodybuilding. You know? yes. so you satisfy that, and then posing became in a... Again, analytical 
thing with me in bodybuilding see? because yeah. one thing I realized was I'm not going to be the biggest guy on stage. Like I have the most muscles. You got three rounds of bodybuilding. So I identify me as a bodybuilder by those three rounds. Yes. So round one was a physique presentations, you know, and everything. You got to round three. That was that posing. It's mm -hmm. part of bodybuilding. Yes. But it wasn't a whole lot of interest in that round. Mm -hmm. And I decided, well, let me take that portion of bodybuilding and hang my name on it. So yeah. I kind of focused on trying to be an entertainer. Yeah. And you, man, you set yourself apart. You really did. You <laughs> really did. And, and your record speaks for itself. You have plenty of wins to prove that. Plenty of top five, top three finishes to prove it for sure. Let me, you know, let me ask you this. I, and I can only imagine, you know, what was it like, you know, back in the magazine era, let's say the 80s right. and 90s, when you were going international to compete through the IB, IFBB? Like, um, I mean, was it crazy to be in these foreign countries and think, here I am, Vince Taylor? I oh, John, I lost you in the very end. I got a little computer glitch. Oh, no, I'm on freeze right now. Okay, now I'm good. I, okay, great, great. Give me again. Sure. Yeah. So I, you know, just to pick your brain, what was it like in the pre-internet kind of magazine era where you leave your home country, let's say the nineties or something, and you go over to, you know, one of these grand prix in another country and everybody knows who you are. Oh, I maybe lost. Oh, we froze up again. Oh, yes. <laughs> I heard you leave the country nineties. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was just saying, what was it like to have been embraced by all these other countries and cultures back then to be a star? Oh, 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 man. That was the beauty of it. That was the beauty of it. Because what people don't know is that I lived in Berlin, Germany, right? And I'm 27 years old. I'm over in Europe. I'm not even into bodybuilding at that time, 1983, 80, 80, 84. And when I got into bodybuilding, well, of course, the only way I was getting in magazine coverage was from the muscle and fitness that they would have at the uh, armed forces stores. Yeah. I would go and get the magazine. Every three months they would come in, you know, three months late. Mm. But when you had that bite about bodybuilding, when I got into it because of a bodybuilder who came to Berlin, which is a good friend of mine today, John Brown. Yeah, and, John uh, Brown, wow. Oh my God, that's my guy. I didn't know. know there was a connection, I, I, wow. I saw John Brown, you gotta understand, I'm in Berlin, Germany. I've uh, been over there at that time for about almost, 10 years? Yeah, almost, yeah, about seven years. But, um, and, and then I finally got into bodybuilding in 84, and I recall going down main streets in, in, in West Germany, in Berlin, in the city, uh, the main street called the Kampusendam. And as I'm walking down there, here comes this object toward me, uh, this big brother wearing some high yellow tights with quads of like, oh, ridiculous, a tiny waistline, this big, upper body V taper, yeah. uh, jerry curl, 6'2", 240. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, you know, because I like bodybuilding. I wasn't doing any bodybuilding, but I always liked it. Mm -hmm. And then I saw John, it was like, wow. And people look at, look at this guy, this guy, this guy. That's why I always said to myself, that's what I want people to say about me. Look yeah. at this guy, right? So yeah. we befriended each other. We had a great conversation. And when I saw that, you know, that's what got me involved in it. But then that made bodybuilding more interesting. So yeah. I'm now yeah. looking at the German magazines of bodybuilders and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that was the bike, you know, I love to be in this magazine. I would love to be in that magazine one day, you know. And it sparked that old thing I had when I was a kid, maybe 12, 13 years old, when I saw the Three Stooges Sunday morning matinee TV. The Three Stooges and Hercules. Hercules. And I saw those guys in that boat rowing and Hercules, and this guy was playing the Hercules role, he started getting muscles. I remember the character from, I think it was Larry Carey and Mo. I think Mo from the Three Stooges was looking at the guy talking about his arms, like, look at this guy as he was rowing this boat, right? Yeah. I'm thinking, wow, look at this, this is crazy. Yeah. Me, I wanted to be the first black Hercules after seeing that. Yeah. So that kept me going on. I always wanted to be Mr. America. And then when I saw John in 83, 84, it was like, you know what? I started going to the gym and training a little bit. Mm -hmm. He told me himself, he said, Vince, you got some pretty good arms. Your calves are phenomenal. I'm weighing about 180, maybe 175, 80 pounds. You know? mm -hmm. That's all I did. I'm 27 years old. Wow. Okay, I'm not even in the bodybuilding. I'm nothing about bodybuilding to that degree. Mm -hmm. That's the story of it. Then I started training. And then I put my sights on, one day I love to be Mr. America. Because John, Mr. America, uh, Mr. Universe, Mr. Yeah. World three times, Mr. Universe three times. I'm like, I got to do that. 
Yeah. Man, so I got myself settled in and that's where everything started, bro. That's an amazing story. So that is so cool that John Brown inspired you. John Brown. And as you describe that, Vince, you were that to me. I saw you. <laughs> Isn't that exciting when you get that, that rush when you see people, you're like, man, I got, whew. and then to have that person talk to you. Yeah, exactly. You know? It was like, wow, it was so crazy. Exactly. And I never forgot that, yeah. you know, and it kept with me the whole time because I saw similarities between other people when I did get into the scene, mm -hmm. which was about a year and a half after that. Yeah. I found myself in um, uh, New York watching uh, Corey Everson win the Olympia. Wow. Okay, and Legend. I was sitting down the front, man, you know, and I recall an incident which made me go, I would never be like that. You know, I ran into my uh, uh, now, not good friend, but competitor wise, Rich Gaspari, you know, yeah. and I was in an elevator with my friend and I remember, uh, what's her name, Julia Bergman from the from Netherlands. Again, one of the people I saw in the German magazines yeah. at home in Berlin. You know, yeah. I'm looking at these all international players, yeah. right? Yeah. So picture this, Jay. I'm in the elevator. The door opens up. The elevator's about, you know, five feet by five feet, little tiny thing. The door opens up, and I walk right in there, and there's Richard Gaspar. I thought the world was coming to an end. Yeah. I'm standing there. I looked at Richie, and I'm like, oh, my God. Then I looked at Julia Bergman, and I told my friend, I said, Julia Bergman, yeah, she's smaller than what I thought, you know, because she's yeah. kind of small, right? And yeah. she kind of like, yeah, but she said to me, and I'll never forget it, Big things come in small packages. And I was like, wow. Immediately, I reverse turned, looked at Richie. I was like, this guy's not gonna believe it. We talk with him every day in the lunchroom back at the barracks over there with the guys, right? I'm like, got some courage up. Richie gets fired. Richie, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah. Like, this close to it, right? This yeah. close. How are you, man? And he just looked straight through me. <laughs> didn't answer, didn't say anything. I was like, ooh. ooh. I, I was crushed. I was yeah, crushed. We, yeah. left, we left there and walked out. But that's just like, and I said to myself, if I ever made it, I would never be like that, you know? And I, and I, kept, I kept my word to that. Yeah. I don't care who you are. If a fan talks to me, listen, you got a minute to give me, I got a minute to give you. Yeah. Okay? That, that was my mantra. That's just the way I am. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a great way to live, too. Oh, God. Let me ask this, you know, knowing that you started in your, like, mid to late 20s, too. Yeah. You obviously, I mean, obviously you had wonderful genetics for bodybuilding, but how quickly before you turned pro? Because it seems like you were like late eighties already rocking and rolling. You were in the mix. That's a good question. Oh, we froze again, baby. Oh, okay. I got you back though. That, um, it took me from 84 to start training and to win my first contest. And then I, I tore my bicep, my okay. left bicep training um, after I won that, you know, that amateur show, mm -hmm. um, I was training for the America actually, and I was guest posing because I had made it to a point to where the same show I entered at Mr. Berlin that year, the following year, I was going to enter it again. The guy said, you should be the guest poser. I'm like, what? You know, you, yeah. you advance that much. Right. Yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. You know, boom. So I had a couple of guest appearances around, uh, Western Europe. And um, I went to one spot. John had showed up. Mm. Picture this. John had showed up. And I was so excited because I just wanted to be on stage with John Brown. My, you know, just oh, to be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, he would, we made it a point that he was going to pose that night. It was my gig. He, had, he showed up. And the guy said, yeah, we'd love to have you on stage. So John was going to pose too. So I'm backstage getting ready for my, my, one of my three exhibitions. You know, as an amateur, I'm like happy now. I do that. I had two the weeks before I had two. And uh, a quick story in the middle. I went to see a um, Bazaar, what is that? Uh, horoscopes uh, mm -hmm. person. And they told me that I had three opportunities. He said, you're going to get three opportunities, man, to make some money in this bodybuilding thing. But one of them is going to be bad. I'm like, okay, well, you know, left it and went on about my business. Mm -hmm. Speed back up to the show. Mm -hmm. I did those two events two weeks prior. This is my third event. I'm in the pump up room. So the guy comes backstage and I'll never forget it. Like all excited. Vince Taylor, John is standing right beside me. Mm -hmm. So Vince, uh, you got two more minutes. Are you ready? I'm excited. You know, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, John is here. I'm going to show off now. And I, I had seven pounds uh, curl dumbbell in my hand and I was curling. And he said, Vince, are you ready? I said, yes, I am. Give me two minutes. So I did one, two, three, pop. Felt like a, I heard a sound of a wet rag tearing. Oh, 
So I looked out and I saw my form, dude, gee, it was just black and blue. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm like, I asked John, I said, John, what is this? So John looked at me and said, oh, Taylor, 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 like that. I said, what? I'm like, what? I'm sitting on the stair, on the stool, waiting to go in on stage. I'm like, what? And I'm looking at my bicep and it's just, why? It's this wagging, right? And, um, ooh, I've lost you, Jay. Oh, I'm here, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what happened there, but I'm gonna keep yeah. on going. <laughs> yeah, I see ya, yeah. <laughs> so um, what happened was I simply decided that I would, um, you know, I asked John, so John, what you think? So I shook my bicep and you can see it just flopping. Oh. Um, I can could, I could hit it and it contracted, but it just wobbled a little bit. A good friend of mine who was there with me, um, our, our, our better friend was a surgeon, right? And he came backstage, he's like, Vince, oh, he shook his head really quickly, Vince, what'd you do? I said, I didn't do anything. It just made a sound and look at this. He said, you tore your tendon. I said, what does that mean? He said, you tore it. You might as well forget about it, man. Forget about what? He said, you, your career is done. Wow. <laughs> what? So I said, oh my God. So I just looked at it, man, shook it off. Went on stage, went on and posed anyway. Had a fantastic time, mm -hmm. fantastic time. But I tore my bicep at that earlier stage and that shut me right out of it. Yeah. So I got healed. Uh, made my way back to the U.S. to do a show, which was, I believe, in New Jersey. Well, I did come back and win the Mr. America. That's the that's the end of the story, right? Right. He won yeah. the Mr. Yeah. America in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I was just thrilled. And that was a start, you know. Wow. And that was what eighty seven, eighty six. Your arms are like your tr one of your trademarks. I feel like yes. you, you always had amazing arms. Who knew that you had ever <laughs> tore a bicep, let alone so early in your career? Absolutely. Oh gosh, wow. Uh, let me ask you this, along with kind of freak injuries. Was it an Olympia or a Grand Prix or something where you hurt your eye? Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, I lost you part to, the, to the come up to this, but I heard you say about hurting your eye. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that was a, a freak accident, man, going to flying over to Helsinki for my second Olympia. Right. And uh, we had got, we flew over to Helsinki. Um, we had Hurricane Andrews down here that same year. Mm. And uh, a couple of weeks later, a week later, so we flew out to uh, Helsinki. Once we arrived and got to the baggage claim and we were going to the hotel and I had my luggage up in the, uh, the rack above my head. So I reopened the cabin up and the strap from the luggage, you know, swung down and just slapped me right in the eyeball, hit me right in the corner. Oh. And it actually scratched the corner. And uh, man, I was no more good at that moment because we got there on a Tuesday or Wednesday, I believe. All I know is that we went to the hotel after I finally got inside. I sat into a chair, man. I had to hold, literally hold my eye open because right. it slash was right there where the eyelids came together and it burnt like fire, man. It felt like somebody just punched you in the face. It was incredible. Yeah. And my sitting there, whole, I sat in the chair that for four hours. So my wife, was able to contact the hotel staff people to try to find a doctor. And the doctor finally came over about nine that night. We was there about 11 that morning. He got there about eight, nine that evening. I finally saw a doctor and he gave me some cream to put in my eye. And he says, this would help uh, cure the pain, right? So I'm like, okay, I'll try that cream. Felt like Vaseline. Yeah. So you slap yeah. that in your eye, you're sitting there. But literally I had to sit in a chair and I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't do anything for yeah. three days as I got ready to compete. Right. So it, it was the worst thing in my life, man. Scratch corny. Man. <laughs> God. Man. And you got up, you competed. You, with the oh, John, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, baby. What happened to my interview? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, and you're okay. the man for having seen that through as well. I mean, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And again, you, you nailed your posing routine, even with the eye patch. Oh, again, sitting there for hours in a uh, fall of a tree, uh, I can't imagine. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. So uh, let me ask this, you know, I mean, for you, I mean, of course, you have some Olympia titles to your name, but do you, you know, what is your career highlight? Like, what, what do you, if you had to pick one, is there a contest or a moment that you, you reflect on the most? Ooh, that's hard because I think everyone every emotional feeling that I got on stage at any given time meant the moment. If it yeah. was that winning moment, it was like registered high off the lot. If it was that depressing moment, it registered deep. <laughs> but just to have a gratifying uh, moment, mm -hmm. which I didn't fully see 
to ex extend was the 1990, was it 91, 92 Olympia in Orlando here, Orlando, Florida, where I did the Terminator. Yeah, the Terminator. Oh, man. The crowd, the crowd went crazy. I mean, they was like ballistic. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was something like, wow, that was a level that was so, so rewarding, man. Mm -hmm. And it only magnified itself when I went around the world during that on those Grand Prix tours. Yes. Being in Russia, being in England. Yeah. Man, when you saw the type of uh, uh, characters that were involved in bodybuilding and the personality, especially in Russia. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's straight, everybody's big auditorium. Man, when I hit that routine and finished, they, they just stood straight up and was just awesome. Like, yeah. Beautiful, man. I have so much respect for my Russian uh, yeah. fans and all around, really. Man. They sure. just appreciated what I was doing and I appreciated them. So those are the moments I like to think about when I call show. That show was a good show, but that moment was the best. But I think my breakthrough one was probably the win in the Mr. America or the Lee Haney um, International, the Lee Haney National Championships sure. when I won that show. So, yeah. so that was kind of memorable. Yeah, amazing. So are you following the sport kind of nowadays? Do you follow guys like Brandon Curry or, or you know, some of the competitors? I'm, I'm so far away from the sport now. Yeah. Like, pick it up on my Instagram to see who's doing what, read different flyers about who may be doing what. So I'm in the back seat now on that. Yeah, I understand. Guys. yeah I understand too. And, and, and it's almost um, healthy. You know, it's funny, the, 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 the bodybuilders I admire are like you. It's you, it's Sean Ray, it's Bob Chick. And, and what I mean is it's the people that were able to transition into that next phase, you know, they were able to kind of like leave the competitive part aside, but they still stayed relevant in the sport mm -hmm. and, and they, they contribute, you know, and, and I feel like you're one of those people too, because here you are today, you know, you're still contributing in a very meaningful way. And that's important. Let, let me ask this, you know, do you feel like you get as much satisfaction out of training people as you did, as you did once as a competitor? Uh, not really. It's actually not at all because yeah it's so different because i don't even have a connection to me training and then of course i'm trying to help someone else mm -hmm. um because right now i haven't had a whole lot of interaction of helping other people train you know yeah. um so i've been on a solo thing pretty much for the last five years as far as training not even regularly every once in a while mm -hmm. because of my uh, my uh, invention with my grips and my training philosophy and my training principles I, I can't to wait to talk about that. Account. Yeah, yeah I can't wait. So I've seen a couple of uh, videos on YouTube too. And, and if uh -huh. you don't mind, can we talk about your equipment? I'm Absolutely. A big, yeah, I'm a big at home workout advocate. I'm at anybody exercising advocate, you know, be healthy, mm -hmm. be active. But, you know, sometimes people don't understand how simple it can be, you know? And uh -huh. I feel like your, your invention is just an awesome, awesome tool, you know? So can you share a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I put together because I don't have you on screen, so I don't know what I'm seeing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I see you. Yeah. Okay, good. Then. I this is my my paper version <laughs> of yeah. the Vince Taylor principles. You know, this was my joint rotation and recoil principle, my training manual. Uh, basically, what that was all about is I created some hand grips, some training hand grips, which I call my ball handle training hand grips. Right. And designed to be utilized a certain way, designed to give training and hand grips personally a different comfort level i mean they're hand grips they're training age but you should be able to treat your hands with a, a little differently you know now as yeah. far as exercise what are your tools that we utilize yes um, the barbell itself is just a very uncommon piece of steel you know yes. everybody uses that and just that gripping action everything you know all the pressure you get from having to control that handle creates how you train Yes. So what I was able to do is look at some of the, um, uh, I guess you say injuries or some of the uncomfortableness with different hands and handles. So when I looked at this concept of trying to figure out how I could train my way, but when I came across this training tool was because of a rehab movement. I tore my, uh, my right tricep wow. tendon trying to change a security light on the top of my garage. Oh my goodness. for the Arnold's, okay. Okay, I'm up there, you know, yeah. on the light in the garage and went to come down off that ladder. And man, I put that one leg back on that ladder to come down off that roof. And that ladder just went zoop. Oh. 
and I found myself clawing at the top of my garage roof, coming off the edge, and <laughs> pow, hit that driveway and tore my tricep. Wow. Oh my God. So that's how that injury came into play. So as I was rehabbing it, speeding it up in the gym, I had taken one of my exercises was the tricep extension that I was told to yes. do on a lighter resistance. So I was doing that. And again, if you're hurt, rehab training is called hurt training. If yes. you're healthy, training is training. Because it's the same exercise, the same thing you're doing. It's yes. the mindset you're utilizing, how you do it and why. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm doing some tricep extensions and somebody came up to me. As I say, John, I'm going to talk to you. Right. I'm in the middle of my reps and somebody was talking to me. So I stopped, took the handle off and I was holding the cable in my hand. And as I was doing that, we were talking, I decided, you know, just went on and did an upset. First, I had the fist around the wire. And then I summary, I put the ball between the two fingers, not consciously, but subconsciously, put it between my fingers and did another extension move. Mm -hmm. As soon as I did that, I saw how I actually actuated the outer head of my tricep. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if you put the ball between these two fingers, right? So I did the same thing. I put it between those two fingers behind the ear, extended it forward, Bingo, I got activation in the rear trans, uh, tricep head. So I'm watching the, the degree of resistance shift from one head to the next, okay? So now I'm going from the side, and I'm in the rear, and the tendon here on the inner head of my tricep is yes. the one I detached and tore. So when I put that ball between the two, the pinky finger and that ring finger, and then extended, I got instant tendon activation right here on the tendon that I had ruptured. Now I'm doing this full exercise all heads are activated, just trying to activate and rehab this one tendon. So this yeah. is like, you are able to take that ball and put it in the position of the finger fold and directly contract the tendon that's attached to that muscle that you injured by utilizing that placement. Mm -hmm. So that gave me a concept. It gave me an isolation concept and a way to control resistance that I can redirect into yeah. any portion of the muscle. So when I did that exercise, and it was spontaneous, it was like, Try that. Look at this. Take the finger, you throw it on a baseball, uh, you extend it, and what happens was it got that alignment to that outer head. So it was like perfect. Okay. Yeah. The key to that was, and I didn't realize until after I did it a few times, is that this open hand positioning like that also deactivates the form. So now I'm thinking all of the movement that I'm doing and everybody else when we are training, when you make a fist. That's where your power generation starts. Yes. Okay, you're curling something now. If I'm training my bicep and I'm trying to get the resistance directly to the bicep, and I see now that this is standard, this is normal what we're doing, this fist activates the form, this gives me more power to get to the secondary movement, which is the bicep curl now. Well, that bicep curl should be the first movement because I'm training biceps. But the resistance is going into the form because it's natural because of that force. Right. This is forcing those uh, flexors to activate. Therefore, you're already in bringing into the secondary muscle power stage. Okay. So now I'm thinking if the hand is open, you're not activating the form. There's no help here now in this lifting of the curl movement. So therefore, the bicep is now acting all along. Yes. So I'm like, wow. So now I'm utilizing a lot of weight, a 40 pound dumbbell or 30 pound dumbbell to get that massive contraction in that bicep to whereas I can simulate that contraction by utilizing mental contraction first yes. and then pulling the resistance into a bicep that's already contracted. Kind of like put the, uh, the horse, now I got the, the cart before the horse. Yeah, yeah. I like that motion because it gave me a sense of control. And if you think about that, that was the whole idea now of the Vince Taylor grips. When you place that ball between the finger pole what you're doing is aligning the attendant attachment to whatever force is necessary to make that muscle contract. Because your elbow is going to be an indicator of direction of your angles of how your muscle is going to be a targeted. And I can explain that real quickly. Yeah. When, I put, when I put that ball into the first two fingers like this, mm -hmm. for example, this is the curling motion. A reason why the hand is open, the fingers are caressing like this is because you want to control that ball right there, right? Mm -hmm. So now the back hand, this position, I call it holding the peak, is the fact that now you have deactivated the form. There's no reason for that fist to activate. So it's deactivated, so that's a secure check number one. So right now, in this position, even if you took your hand and did this and now flex your bicep, you can, you can get a full flexing of that bicep without involving the form. Yeah. How do we train that way? Right. So that was now, that's the beauty of these grips. They give me the opportunity to take a zone, which I call them zone one, zone two, and zone three, 
I can put the ball in, in zone one and train just that head. Yeah. With the bicep training, it's exactly the same way. I look down at my biceps and I go outer head zone one, middle zone two, inner mm -hmm. zone three. Mm -hmm. Those are the connections. So if I go with the outer head, which is right here, zone one, right. do a curling motion, I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel all, I'm sorry, zone three. I'm going to feel that full contraction inside of the bicep right here mm. on the inner head. If I push it over here and do the exact same curling action, flat hand like that, raise up, you feel the resistance go straight down the middle of the bicep. Okay, here, you go down here, you get it on the outer head. So now here, here's the way of saying, what if I got rid of all the heavy work weight I'm utilizing to stimulate any muscle. And I'm visually looking at this, the, the channels of my bicep thinking, the stay in this zone. I don't need a whole lot of muscle to get a full contraction. Right. Okay? That's the end effect of training. We're trying to get that muscle to contract. Mm -hmm. So the muscle's already contracted mentally. So there it is. Pull the resistance into that contracted muscle. Now you've got more a titanic force going into that muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Stimulation is there and the weight is so light because you're not looking at trying to move the weight to get that contraction. You've already got the contraction before you start the movement. You mentally got your contraction started. You're feeding the contraction with the resistance now rather than trying to build every contraction from resistance. Does that make sense? So much sense. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, so much people, sense. Yes. So people do that. They're like, what are you doing with this lightweight? That's why my grips are lightweight resistance panels. Mm -hmm. It's about lightweight approach to training, yes. resistance training. So I'm taking any exercise that you're doing because, again, we're talking hand grips. Hand grips are a tool. So you take any exercise you're doing. This is what my grips are designed for. Yeah. If I'm doing what I call a precision training, I want to sit here and do what I'm doing now and telling people about shaping your muscles, shaping the biceps, shaping different muscles. How do you do that? You don't have tools for shaping nowadays. You got that barbell. Everything right. in the gym is a barbell or right. rope, but you're still making a fist and you're still activating the form because you have to squeeze that guy, right? So yeah. my thing was this. Here's a tool that allows you to place the resistance, control your resistance by placing the ball in a certain finger fold or zone. Now, allowing you to go ahead on and contract that muscle, but you know because of this zone, this alignment here, and the fact when you're curling up, all your resistance is going to be felt on the outer head of that bicep. And those muscle fibers stay in that zone. Oh. Concept of building power and stay in that zone. If you manipulate that zone and break those fibers or work with those fibers, fill them up with blood. That's going to give you that volume inside that muscle that shows you a different look. You're going to see that yes. fullness in, that, in, the, in, the, in the fibers. So now that's what I call shaping the muscle. Shape your bicep. Mm -hmm. Stay in this one zone until you get what you're looking for. And that's going to create that look. Okay. Yeah. And then go down the bicep individually in small sections. Mm -hmm. Train it with 10 pounds. That's yeah. one little section. Rather than closing your fist and now train that same little session that's going to incorporate all this uh, other two zones because you're making a fist. If you train that one zone with a fist movement, now you got 40 pound dumbbells, 100 pound curls and all that kind of stuff, right? But you're still working the same bicep, but I'm saying work the bicep in a smaller chunk, divide and conquer, yeah. better growth, the way I look at it. This is, uh, this is fascinating. This is amazing. <laughs> so it, it's amazing. So and, and I love, I love how your mind works. Oh my gosh, man. So, well, I, I love all of it. So I, it's amazing for a lot of reasons. I think anybody can use this tool. Um, Absolutely. The fact that you're able to isolate your, your three zones or different high heads of the tricep or bicep, huge right there, because a lot of people, you know, struggle with identifying that mind muscle connection. And I feel like that isolation and prioritizing those different zones is a great way to, to kind of circumvent that and help people really learn their bodies and become aware of what they're doing. That sounds amazing. But moreover, I'm sold. I'm going to buy one today um, for a couple of reasons. But a lot of the fans of the show will know this, but you, you're probably not aware. Um, I wouldn't expect you to be, but I, I broke my neck about eight, nine months ago. And I had it used about in April, you know, so three, four months ago. Um, and I say, and so I've been rehabbing it. But part of that rehab is that I had some neurological damage down my left side, primarily my left tricep. So I am rehabbing hardcore. I have been rehabbing every day, six days a week for about three months uh, post-op. So I am in. I'm literally 
I'm literally, Vince, struggling every day to find new techniques to be able to isolate my outer head of my tricep and oh my that God. because they weaken so much. Um, so good, as bro. you're describing this, <laughs> I'm literally hearing you detail how it works off the lever, how I can isolate. And I'm like, this is the, I've been searching for this. So where can people order this? I'm, I, I promise you, I'm going to post on social media. Thank I'm you. On today. I made it simple. VinceTaylorGrips.com. Okay. <laughs> That's my website and also on Amazon. You can get them on okay. Amazon as well. Well, I'm going to get mine today for sure. So that's amazing. And I love that. I don't love by any means. Let me rephrase that. I don't like that you got injured and that's how you discovered it. <laughs> I actually do like, because not everybody's a bodybuilder. To, to right, exactly. Right, now, right. But this is something everybody could use. Absolutely. And, you know, getting back to my training principle, because my training principle is, is a lightweight resistance training. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm trying to do, what, what, I, what I was out to do, and I'm still there right now before I probably make an exit soon, but the concept was to create a training method okay. that would utilize the most use, probably the most least use exercise equipment in the gym, which is the cable machines. Yeah. Okay. You don't see a bunch of crowd around the cable machine. No. But yeah. that resistance training, on the cable machine, allows you to work the entire body doing all the exercises, but you know, a different type of contraction, the one that is more conducive, I think, to the average person. People want to train differently, but all you hear about training is go hard, go heavy, go home. Right. That's not for everybody. No. You know, I like to utilize what I call my uh, functional training asset to it. That's why this concept of my lightweight resistance, because lightweight resistance training provides the average person, man and woman and child, the ability to start taxing their physiques, building their bodies, understanding their bodies with under control and stress movements. Yeah. So now if I'm utilizing cables versus barbells and dumbbells, there's a smoother, more non-intimidating effect to yeah. training. Okay. Yeah. So now when I get a person who wants to train in the mornings, like I was doing some personal training and you know, people are getting up four or five o'clock in the morning and five and six going to train first and go to the gym. And I asked myself personally, like, I don't want to get up at 5.30 in the morning and go to the gym to work out. Let's say I'm working my legs. Sure, I'm going to go sure. now and do some heavy squatting. Right. That ain't me. I'm going right. to the gym and do some heavy bench pressing or some heavy this and that. I want an exercise program the average person can do that would require you to concentrate on the benefits of getting full contraction, maximizing stimulation of your exercise, right? Getting that body toned up and trained, but not worrying about beating it down. I want you to leave the gym with energy, yeah. okay? You want to come into the gym. You want to do an exercise to know that, well, I'm doing, look, I'm doing the Vince Taylor curl with the single ball, but now I'm also doing that same curl because I want to train heavier with the double ball uh, right. feature. That's what this double ball feature is, okay. okay? Instead of working one zone at a time, you get a chance to work with what I call that fist grip. Now you can go heavier. Okay. One, one of these train like this, I train with 10 pounds or less. On a cable wow. machine. That's and all you need, yeah. 10 pounds, believe me, you yeah. will get, and people, they go, oh, this, I did this. I got such a pump. I'm not interested in you getting a pump because you're misutilizing what this is happening to you. The result of what you're getting, you're getting maximum contraction and stimulization by using a lighter weight and already conducing that contraction mentally. Yeah. Okay? That's where your benefit is coming from, that quality of type of training. It's not a high stress training. OK, mm -hmm. so your functional training, you just want you want to be able to make sure your butt, you know, your body's in good shape. What I was saying, I went to the gym and beat myself down. So yeah. literally my principle and concept, I take you in front of the cable machine. You do all the body exercise you've always done. You utilizing these grips. But the key to the fact is you understand that it's not based on weights. Right. OK, you're going to go through all the range of motions, everything you would normally do with a barbell and dumbbell. But you're not going to worry about weights. You're going to worry about resistance and controlling contraction. That's the benefit yeah. of your working out. All right. You don't smooth exercise, functional exercise, flexation movements. You know, I put these here. When people ask you, well, how do you train your, your finger flexation? Mm -hmm. Resistance bands attached to it. Right. I'm doing this right now. I'm flexing my fingers. I'm training the palm. OK, I flip yeah. it over. Now I'm doing some finger flexation for people who are typing all the time. You know, yeah. you got to just keep those fingers right. Wrist rotate, you know, all, all kind of exercise you're doing to resist this training just to get a little bit of rehab on every muscle group by utilizing resistance bands. And get in front of the cable machine, you can go crazy with the weights you want to use, different type of training. Man, and I got you in there and out there in 30 minutes with a total body workout that you can go out breathing without saying, Oof, 
I had to go through that to get out the gym. Exactly. And, 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 uh, and it's so versatile. And, and, and to your point, you know, for people who are typing all day and, you know, yeah. and, and again, the older I get, the more I appreciate my joints, <laughs> the more yeah, I buddy. <laughs> my hands, my wrists, because you use those every day and you need to take care of them. You know, that's and, exactly uh, right. Yeah. That's this so- is such an amazing tool, such an amazing, amazing tool. Uh, and again, for like everybody, uh, anybody could Ooh, use it. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I like how you think, you know, your philosophy is, it's like the anti-ego, you know, you're, it's not about poundage. It's not about heavy. It's like so anti-bodybuilder in certain ways. Like, <laughs> right. You know, like, it's more I don't believe in go heavy, go home. Yeah. Never did. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. You gotta be, you gotta lift the gym to be strong. I'm not strong, but look what I achieved. Sure. Look, sure. look at, look at my, you know, Vince, what do you eat? I don't eat like you guys. I eat three meals a day. Always, for all my life. I drink Were you Coca-Cola. always that way? How did always, you? Always. Wow. Always. Did you supplement with shakes? That's my or... worst thing, Jay. Yeah. Were you, were you able to supplement with shakes throughout, or were you just, you were okay with three meals a day? I like the shakes. I never banked on them. I did it because they were the end thing. You know, I understood supplementation. And if I wasn't going to eat, drink a shake, it made sense. So why not do that? I never re- didn't rely on them. Yeah. But my, my thing was, you know, you got it. John Brown told me from Tay, you are what you eat. He said, if you want to eat, you want to get big, you got to eat beef. Beef, you look like a bull, okay? You eat chicken, you're going to look like a chick. And yeah. heaven forbid, you eat a lot of fish, you're going to look like a fish. Yeah. And when I structure my diet and everything, I do that in that fashion because it holds true. Yes. You know? Off season, I'm trying to get as big as possible back in the day, eat a lot of beef, you know? If I'm trying to diet up, the first thing I do, I go to chicken. Okay, I'm yeah. switching my dietary now. If I can't lose the weight and do what I'm trying to do through that dieting thing from eating that chicken, then I have to get lose more weight, keep my protein high. I switch to fish. Okay, yeah. get that weight down a little bit, get that protein right. I'm still maintaining my size. I'm still fueling my, my body, my protein levels is fine. So, but I looked at my dietary switch up. So when people ask me, how do you maintain your diet? How did you learn this? Every day, common sense. Yeah. I know what happens when I eat beef. I know what happens to my physique when I eat chicken. And I know what happens to when I eat fish. Yeah. You're going to lose weight. Look, you're going to maintain weight. You're going to lose weight. Eat that beef and yeah. add beef. Yeah. Very simple. You know, it's amazing, too, because I feel like uh, sometimes, I'll, I'll speak for myself, oftentimes I can just make simple things so complex, you know, oh, so hard. Absolutely. And, you know, it's so important to have to talk to someone like you and mentor and to, that. And you can just say, hey, keep it simple. Don't overthink it. And yeah. I've done it. And, you know, you've been there. You've done it successfully. And and uh, yeah, it's just so good. It's refreshing almost to hear, you know, hey, man, you know, just pay attention to your body. Pay attention to basic nutrition. People today will have you think you need a coach and you have oh. to have a trainer and a guru and a what, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you brought, not to cut you off, but I'm glad you brought that up because when I was asked too, but this, you're training, man, who coached you? Who trained you? I did it all myself, me, right. myself, and my wife. And right. what I mean by that is I had nobody, for example, even getting into the body book. I'm 27 years old. I'm reading magazines. Okay. But at 27 years old, reading a magazine in 84, I was able to read, do what I wanted to do my way. And create a physique that made me a year later win the Mr. America. Amazing. That same guy who had that type of knowledge yeah. move over another notch. Okay, 1988, he comes over to the U.S. just to see what's going on. 90, uh, 80, uh, 97, I'm sorry. And got into a show because I wanted to compete in the MPC. I heard about that in Europe. You know? Yeah, yeah. All I knew was AAU. Wow. But my point that. was the same lack of knowledge guy to put himself wow. into a different category to train. 80 was 84, 85, 86. This guy now is he's over here making a stink in America because he got he won a show in Jersey. You know, man, he took fourth in the national championship, something I didn't know nothing about. You know, and this is from a guy who knows nothing about bodybuilding. Right. OK, nothing about training and nutrition. Right. I did it my way. Wow. And I kept that same thing going until four years later. A year after that, I'm winning my first pro show, 1989, you know, winning yeah. the Night of Champions, you know, then, then the Olympia, third place in the Olympia. Yeah, I mean, this is the guy with four years worth of bodybuilding knowledge, mm-hmm. okay, and training and 
That's the story. <laughs> you know, who, I, you know, that is so impressive. <laughs> you know, so other than John Brown, did you have anyone else, uh, maybe the weeder organization, anybody come in and kind of take you in and nurture you? Nobody. That nobody. Is, just my wife. And my wife amazing. was my mirror. She would that's look at my physique and she'd go like, oh, that don't look too good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got to change, change that. All right. So, okay, I'm changing it. She had an eye for what, you know, what they're looking for, I would, I would say. But as far as nutrition, the same thing. It was like, how hard can it be? You know, if the purpose of eating is to keep a certain food volume coming in, that's going to make a weight uh, resistance or weight addition possible. Right. Understand the principle that you have to do. Now, if you have to eat a certain type of food to work with the concept of losing weight and getting shredding you know, down that road, then there's a way to eat. But now you'll find out that once you open that book, it's the same thing. Yeah. Everybody's doing the same thing. Well, I'm going to eat five grams of rice. I'm going to eat 10 grams right. of rice. You're going to eat rice. So how many is up to me, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people, I just sit back and I shake my head. I go like, I hear guys and ladies that say, this guy, my trainer, my trainer, thank right. goodness for my trainer. He did this, he did that. And I asked myself, what did your trainer really do? Right. Does your trainer accept, say, X amount of reps, X amount of weight. Mm -hmm. What is he doing for you? I mean, yeah. Everything is coming from you. Own right. your yeah. work. You know, look, reverse that camera. Look at yourself and say, exactly. I'm building this physique. Yeah. My trainer oh. is helping me with instructions, but I'm building this physique. You know, so right. I don't give a whole lot of credit, you know, cadence to trainers. I don't talk about them. I, it's great. You know, I didn't need one. I didn't have a training partner either. I did everything by myself. So yeah. <laughs> that's another thing. So I just be relying on me myself. Page. Yeah, I mean, one of the most winning bodybuilders of all time. Yeah, I mean, that says a lot. It says a whole lot. And and, and keep it simple: calories in, calories out. Calories out. A goal. Don't make it hard. Don't make it hard. Yeah. Dieting, like, which what are you going to eat? Oh well, they say you got to eat chicken and rice. All right, well, chicken and rice. Here it goes. How hard is it to make chicken and rice? The problem comes from people who wanted to make it taste better. Now your work is in there. Okay. Now the work is in there. Because when I went to John Brown, here's the story real quick. Yeah. When I met John in 84, he asked me, I asked him if I could come to California just to see if I, what bodybuilding is all about, right? Sure. So he said, yeah, come on over and visit. I did that. When I got there, John was getting ready for the Night of the Champions mm. that year. And um, he, he, he comes in and he has, we went out to the grocery store. I'll never forget it. I just arrived to LA and went out to the grocery store. And he came in, he had a, a, a pot full of chicken chicken legs, and chicken yeah. breast, I'm sorry. And he simply was boiling them. A big boiled chicken breast. And that was it. That's so funny. Like, oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I'm over here, get a mind. This is day one of my seven, two weeks stay. I was going to do two weeks. Come over and just learn some bodybuilding from John. And when he saw what he was eating for this diet, he was like, he said, Taylor, you got to make this stuff taste great. It's just going to go down and do what it has to do. Right. So eat it this way. Don't make yourself a whole lot of work. If it's mm -hmm. terrible, that's the punishment of doing your diet. You want to sit here and make up recipes and make work for yourself to go ahead on and do it just so you can eat this. Right. I'm like, you got a point to stay bland and just chuck that stuff on down. As nasty as it was, yeah, that's where I learned it from. I'm like, shoot, I just did that, you know, which was cool. So yeah. learning stuff from him, small things from John about how to eat, identifying my foods, how to train. John Brown was a, oh, a seriously strong guy, big, huge yeah. peck. That dude could throw up some iron. You know, he scared me because I'm again, Jay, I'm trying to learn how to be a bodybuilder. Right, right. I, I saw him, I invited myself to his home here in California. Yeah. I flew from <laughs> Berlin to John. And when I got there, I watched him train. I'm like, this guy is moving to his gym. I met Sean Ray. He was 18 years old. Wow. At the time. He told me, Vince, I want you to meet this guy, youngest teenage in the world, bad guy. I met Sean Ray for the first time. You know, yeah. he was getting ready for the nationals. And I'm looking at Sean going like, wow, man, you know, I think I can do this. Yeah, I like to do this myself. You know? yeah. He took me down to Venice Beach. I saw Tony Pierce and I saw um, bodybuilders go by. He asked, you know who this guy is? I don't know anybody. He yeah. said, that's Tony Pearson, man. Yeah. And you know who this guy is? I said, no. That sounds I'm like, wow. I mean, like my eyes like this big, Jay. Yeah, of like, course. This is Muscle Beach. Yes. The only thing, only thing got me was from the magazines I just saw of the Night of the Champions, mm -hmm. these guys walking by me person walked right past me and I didn't even recognize him because I didn't see anything on them to make me think that's the same guy. 
It was rather thin, like myself. Yeah. Like, I can beat you. <laughs> My mind was like, I can beat you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But that's how that connection started with what bodybuilders look like. And then, of course, yes. I yeah, went to the gym and I saw Mike Christian, Victor yes. Richards, uh, some Christian. other bodybuilders. Man, It was yeah. like, wow, that was the bite. Right. Yeah. But then it came down to these guys are all being trained. Charles Glass, that's the name I forgot. Charles yes. Glass. You know, and I met these guys. Like, wow, look at these guys. So, needless to say, the reputations of these guys, who they were, me, just a greenhorn, just in yeah. bodybuilding, shot, star shot, looking at these guys, went back to Berlin, started training, and kept what I knew to be truthful. And then a year later, I'm on stage with these guys. I, I, man, crazy. I'm going to go tonight and look up the pictures of that contest because I just imagine you as a man possessed. You go home, <laughs> you got the bug, You've see, it's real now. You've met It's my real. Friend. And it's real, you know. You've seen these guys. You've trained. It was them, real. Right? Wow. Yeah, <sighs> and it, it, your success came quickly. Yeah, it did. Very. Um, so, man, that's amazing. You, what kind of athlete were you growing up? Because obviously, your genetics are, are just meant for this. I did it all. You know, I, in high school, I, I was a high school quarterback. Uh, um, always wanted to be a quarterback, and I, I pop Warner and everything else all the yeah. years. I was a high school quarterback. I was I started on the basketball team. I was a track star. Uh, just couldn't play baseball. Didn't like that ball coming at me. Yeah, uh, sure. I could run it down in the field, but I, you know, too much running. Yeah. Uh, soccer, I could play soccer, but I, I was athletic. Yeah. But I found my thing in track, basketball, and, of course, football. Those were my threes. But I wasn't good enough to get a scholarship, you know. Yeah. So – it it small just you, man. You, were, you were meant to be a bodybuilder. I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm telling you. And, and the guy who got me started in bodybuilding in high school, mm -hmm. uh, kicked the flame again, was my boss, my high school football coach. Okay. And the guy looked like a Greek god, man. And <laughs> all, of, all the, the, the ladies in the, in the high school would like the coach. You know, I would hear about the coach. And you see coach, he would come across the street, and I could see him coming from the gymnasium to the, the main building. He'd come across the street in a T-shirt, and, and, and Jim Schwartz on, this is back in 74 now. Yeah. Okay? Remember the era we're talking here. Sure. Um, dude was swole, man. And, and the women were screaming by the teachers and stuff. But he just looked like a badass um, yeah. bodybuilder, right? But he was a, a power lifter pretty much, right? But just had that look. And yeah. I wanted that so bad, man. And yeah. that got me going, looking, looking at that guy. Yeah. Ooh. But that wasn't in my cards, man. So after high school, I went and found a job. Then... Next thing I knew, my brother wrote me from Berlin. He was in the army. We were going back and forth. I had just moved out my mom's house, got my own place, yeah. and I was filming my stuff. So I wanted to take me a trip to somewhere. So mm -hmm. I decided to go visit my brother in Europe. He's in the army, Berlin, Germany. I heard so much about it from him. I flew over to see him. It was like amazing. Yeah. So I spent 20 days over there, came back home and said, you know what? I got to go back. I sold everything I had and went right back to Germany at the age of 19. <laughs> Couldn't speak the language, didn't have a job. My brother was stationed there, but as I'm coming back, he was writing me, telling me, don't come back over here. I'm not here anymore. I'm leaving. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I got to go back because yeah. this place was amazing. And I went back and of course stayed for 13 years in Berlin behind the Iron Curtain. Another story. <laughs> yeah what an amazing life experience and then to have this whole second chapter of bodybuilding that you never really yeah. planned on and you took it so far uh it's amazing yeah it's such it was, a, it's mind-blowing it was it really mind-blowing because i found something that i liked i could do mm -hmm. uh, the reward was not trying to go out and go after guys you know like okay vince can you be so-and-so i was never about beating anybody right i showed up to a show to see if i could better my physique whether the judges decided it was better than so-and-so's, that's on them. But I was never disappointed in the loss because it wasn't in my hands. All I knew was I'm never coming to a show gunning for anybody because yeah. that guy is one the show that I'm in for a reason. Right. When I got into my first Olympia, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm here, Sean, and some other guys talking about interviews, how important this show is for them. They're trained to win the Mr. Olympia. You know, right. I don't, I'm thinking to myself, I can have all this confidence in the world, but that Mr. Olympia, his name is Lee Haney. Yeah. He's been Mr. Olympia for like five years now. Right. So what makes me think, because I'm turning pro, that I'm going to go and I'm going to win the Olympia. Right. You know what I mean? It just So I use that approach to all my competition. Somebody's yeah. out there better. Let's just so see what you have. 
You're so, so that, unique that you were oh. so objective. You were able to be so objective. Yeah. And in that, you probably didn't suffer as much as your peers that got so emotionally yeah. invested, you know. It's true, 100%. Yeah, that's amazing. So again, thank you. I know we're coming up a, a little bit on time. One more question. I, I, Absolutely. Yeah, just because, you know, I have you and it's amazing. So outside of bodybuilding, what are other interests? I mean, are there anything else? Do you do read music, anything like that? Well, I tell you, um, because bodybuilding was such my entire uh, career, mm -hmm. most of my adult life, you know, bodybuilding is 24-7. Okay, when you got into it, the trainings, when you started bodybuilding, it was 24 seven for me. As you develop into it as a lifestyle, your main focus is always focused around bodybuilding first and then doing something after to spin off. Sure. So I didn't have any hobbies because I had too much time trying to cultivate my, my craft, right? Mm -hmm. um, so after bodybuilding tapered off and that, I can see where that uh, stepping away from average life uh, enjoyments comes into play because it's like well what do you like to do yeah well you know not really too much because it's not interesting yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah so no i'm not doing a whole lot of anything on also even now at yeah. 65 you know i find myself concerned about just um this business now you know just sure. staying keeping viable keeping moving my health is yeah. fantastic yeah. you know i have any issues i'm creative i got things going on but yeah. just this drive to make something happen, to reinvent Vince Taylor right now at this stage because I should be retiring and yeah. I'm not financially in a position to retire and I'm not mentally in a position to retire. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what are you doing? There's your dilemma. <laughs> well, you know, you're such a force. You are such a life force, Vince. Like you, you have energy. I cannot believe you're 65 or is that what you said? Almost 65? 65 next month. That's crazy to me. Again, if, if you don't age, so that's a big part of it. But but again, you're vibrant, you know, like, yeah, so it's good. I, I You know, don't even think retirement. You have so much more to give. You have so much more to give so many people. Uh, it's pretty, you know, it's, it is inspiring. And and again, you know, from the, the bottom of my heart, man, not only have I been a fan just on the peripheral watching you and it, just enjoying your success, but hey, I'll never forget that guy that took 30 minutes to talk to me in a store, you know? And so that would be me, Mr. That's Talking. You. That's you. And, uh, you know, that's really, you know, that was <laughs> important, man. It's definitely important to me. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, anyway. So it's certainly <laughs> something I appreciate very much. And, and you're the man for it, you know? And what a great, like, great advocate for our sport and just, just a great person to have uh, in our community. I appreciate being here and appreciate you saying that. Makes makes the man feel good. It's true. And I'm going to buy your grips today. So I hope <laughs> Make that you feel better. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'll let you know, too. I'll, I'll send you a little message afterwards because I'm, okay. I'm really having this tricep and this is like pretty much meant for me. <laughs> okay. I want you I want you to get – here's the deal with the grips now because people – some of them get confused. And for you personally, I want you to know things. Please. Number one, I make them in different sizes, okay? Small. Okay. Smalls, the medium, and the large, all right? Okay. All three sizes work it's because it's just the placement of the ball in the finger fold. Okay. Everybody's fingers are different in size and length. So a smaller hand would probably you feel better using the smaller grip, okay? Some of the smaller kids or the ladies and stuff like that. But my universal size, which is a one and a half inch ball, fits mm -hmm. and works perfectly because you're not gripping anything. You're holding it. Yeah. Remember that. You're just caressing this ball right there. That's all you want to do. Okay. Never, okay, even when you're using this, when you start training, you have a, an instinct to do this, yeah. <laughs> okay? Make that fist. You wanna, you're want you not supposed to make a fist. Anybody who sees this video we're doing now, the hand stays open. The okay. ball is placed in the, like you're throwing a baseball. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should look. And it should be like that when you curl, when you're doing any exercise, because the wrist should never be stiff and straight. The hand should never be doing like this when you're exercising. Yeah. It should always be relaxed. It's always relaxed. It's just like place the hand ball in a relaxed hand, cup it a little bit to control it, and that's the position you want to always be in. Any angle that you're training with my grips and people, if you're utilizing these and you're saying, well, the wire is hurting my hand, mm -hmm. I'm like, because you're not supposed to make a fist. Okay. You're supposed to keep it out here. If you make a fist, of course it's going to hurt your hand. Right. <laughs> All right? Right. It stays there. You drag the weight up. You don't pull it in. Like it. it stays like that. So remember that. And for you, get the yellow pair because okay. the yellow pair is the universal fit. 
Okay. Guys with larger hands, my hand's not that large, but I love the Reds because they feel comfortable, they're great, and they just give you so much more support. So look, you can use any size, anybody can use any size, because remember, they stay there. Yeah. They don't go there, okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's their secret. Hey, thank you for the secret. I got it. You got it. Definitely. Um, so the yellow pair universals would I'll grab. I can't wait to try it, honestly. Man, uh, I really can't amazed. wait to add it. And remember, your lightweight resistance. You're going to be utilizing these grips, even if you're using a double ball to simulate a ball, a fist grip. You're strong with this grip anyway. My thing is this. Your weight is going to be 15 pounds or less. Your maximum curl on a cable machine, if you're utilizing these in this grip yeah. position, it's going to be probably 25 pounds. Right. It's going to beat you up, yeah. okay, for 25 pounds. Remember that. Okay. It cuts yeah. all your weight resistance in half in any exercise you're doing. Well, good, because slow and steady wins the race, and I'm, I'm rehabbing, so good. I, it's better to go and really concentrate and feel that. That uh, Yeah, I can't wait to try it. Um, <laughs> man, you know, your mind is – you're very, like – you're cerebral, you know, and that you were able to even invent this and it's just years of trial and error. And I, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And it makes total yeah. sense the way you just worked. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Well, Vince, thank you again. Let me uh, ask this last question. So uh, you gave us your website. Um, other than that is maybe social media, your IG or Facebook or those. Yeah, it's just Vince Taylor. You'll see it on that Vince Taylor 5-0. I did that when I was 50. So it was yeah. Vince Taylor 5-0. Yeah. Now I need to change it to Vince Taylor 6-5. Jeez. Oh, you're good. Hey, man, you still look five though. It's not like you're still fooling all of us. That's for sure. Uh, well, thank you again, Vince. This is uh, again, been my pleasure. I would love to do it again sometime. Anytime, anytime. Please believe me that. Great. Thank you again, everybody. This is True Story, John Gibson, today's guest, Vince Taylor. Thank you, Vince.